Well, let's illustrate that in a little bit more detail and also have a look at what happens uh, when we've put something into the input of one of these generator nodes. So let me lay down another shape node. And this time, instead of a circle, let's create a rectangle. Let's have a look at that. And I'm going to shift and drag to downsize that. And I'm going to put this rectangle's output and connect it to the input of our second shape, which was our circle. And then let's visualize that and see what we're getting. Well, we see that we're getting a square. And that's true of all the components, including the alpha component. And what's happening is that our circle, which we're generating here, isn't being added to the color plane. Instead, if we have a look at the image tab here, we can see that this has changed when we made a connection to the input. This has changed to add plane M. And let's middle click here, and we can see that we've got a color plane, which has RGB components, an A plane, which has just a single component, and an M plane, which just has a single component. There are some implications of this. For example, if I select my Fill tab here, I can choose what color I want to fill my shape with. So, for example, I could give it a nice orange color like that. Uh, but we can see uh, that our circle, which exists here on the M plane, is still just white. And the reason for that is that, by default, this M plane only has a single component. If we want it to reflect color, uh, we have to select M RGB. And we can see that we now have three components like so. We don't have an alpha component. If I select alpha, what I'm viewing here is not the alpha channel of this M plane that I've got selected here. What I'm actually viewing when I select alpha down here is a A plane. And that, of course, is being created by this shape node and is our rectangle. So just to sum up, when you connect an input into a generator node, it will add a plane to the input rather than replace by default. You can get it to replace. I could set this to C and A, and it would replace the input, and our square would disappear, and we would just have our circle. We can also here change the way that it combines uh, those two things. So, for example, we could add the two together. We could subtract them. We could do the minimum, we could do the average, and so on. Let's revert this back to M. So we've now got two planes here. We've got an M plane, and a C plane, and of course an A plane, so three planes. Strictly, let's change this to RGB. And let's have a look at our blur node again, and we can just demonstrate the effect of this. So by default, what's happening is it's blurring all of the color components of our C plane, it's blurring our alpha plane, and it will also be blurring our mask plane. If we wanted it not to blur our M plane, and M stands for mask, by the way, we could just remove this star, and we can see now it leaves the M plane alone and blurs the C and the A. Let's also have a quick look here at the Mask tab again. We've got a, a control here which allows us to select which plane of the image that's being connected into here is going to be used to mask our operation. So, in this case, we're using the A plane. But I could use the M plane. And then we would have the circle rather than the square. And we can see that the letter here has changed M to reflect the fact that the mask that we're using is coming in uh, here. And we can, of course, invert the mask, which produces the negative of 
uh, the earlier result. And we can change the effect of the mask so that it doesn't have 100% effect. And in this case, uh, if it has zero effect, then actually none of our image is going to be filled with color. So that's a little bit more about the effect of generator nodes and how to mask images. So the first thing that should be obvious is that it's very important to be able to create masks accurately. They can be very useful if you want to adjust different parts of your image. Let's start again and bring in an external image. And the way to bring in an external image is using a file node. And by default, it brings in one of the pictures that comes with Houdini. But I'm going to choose a picture which I've taken from Flickr and which is licensed under Creative Commons license. And the credit for that is at the end of the scene as well. And it's this uh, scene of balloons. So let's talk about some very basic ways of affecting this image. And we can see that under the color tab here, we've got a number of ways of changing the coloration of our image. Let's have a look, for example, at the contrast node. And this allows us to change the contrast of our scene for each of our red, green, and blue components. And we can see that's being updated here in the view. And I can change the global contrast like so. One of the most useful nodes for changing your image is the color correct node. Let's have a look at that. And we can see that it has color components which we can add, multiply, and then we can change the gamma and the contrast for our image. So for example, if I were to multiply the image by red, we can see that almost everything turns red. And that's because these components, green and blue, are zero, and they're being lost now from the image. Let's revert that back to defaults. I could add a very dark gray to our image, and we can see that that lightens everything up. Again, let's revert to defaults. Uh, the gamma allows you to change the gamma correction of your image. And if you're not sure what this does, uh, it's worth looking up on Wikipedia. It's essentially a non-linear way of brightening or darkening your image. And contrast is, does more or less what we saw earlier using the contrast node. The good thing about the color correction node, and indeed most compositing packages have a very similar node, is that it divides your image into three different ranges, shadow, midtone, and highlight. And this allows you to apply corrections just to certain parts of your image. So if I wanted to brighten up the dark parts of our image, then I could either add something to those areas, or I can multiply by a factor. So if I multiply by 2.5, we can see that the dark areas of the image are being increased, while the lighter areas are increased by less. Let's try multiplying by red and see what we get. And we can't see very well, but the dark areas have now a slightly redder tone. And the mid-tone and highlight refer, of course, to the middle range of luminance of our image and to the high range of luminance of our image. Let's just adjust the highlights and make them red. And we can see that the brighter areas of our image here are being multiplied by a red component. What happens if I wanted to apply this color correction, say, just to... Uh, the red balloons. 
Well, there are some very powerful nodes in Houdini allowing you to automatically create masks. And this process is known as keying. And if we have a look at our tab menu, we can see that we've got a number of different keys. And the one we're interested in at the moment is the chroma key. So let's lay that down and let's input our image into the chroma key and then visualize it. So at the moment we can see that part of our image is becoming black. And that's also true for the alpha channel. You can see that the alpha channel is becoming black. And what's going on is that this color slider here is selecting a range of colors and luminances in our image and then deleting them from the image. And it's also affecting the alpha channel. So if I want our red balloons to be omitted from our image, we need to move our slider round to here. And we can, by clicking on the central area, we can move the whole slider. If we click on one of the borders, we can increase the range of our slider. And so I've done that, and now more or less all of our balloons are selected. Let me just increase this so that it becomes covers the brighter areas. Maybe increase this a little bit. And let's identify this color. So that's because this is not moving enough into this area. So that's more or less it. It's more or less affected. Uh, balloons. So what happens now if we were to use this as a mask going into our color correct? Let's just feed that in. And by default, the alpha component of this is going to be used as a mask. And we can see the alpha component, in fact, uh, is white for all of the areas that aren't in our red balloons, and black where we had our red balloons. So let me go into our color correct, onto the mask tab, we can invert the mask. Let's visualize our balloons. And now, if I were to color correct, say by multiplying these by something very small, our balloons will become black. And then adding back something that's, say, an orangey color or a green color, our balloons would become green. We could just uh, multiply them by green. So let's revert that to defaults. Take this, multiply them by a greeny color. Like so. And we can see that we can change the color of our balloons using this color correct node masked off by a chroma key so that it only affects certain colors in our image. Let's have another look at another way to key an image, which is a luma key. So let's replace our chroma key with a luma key. And a luma key is more simple uh, because all it does is select parts of your image based on their luminance. And there's some sliders here which allow you to select the range of luminance for which you are going to mask your image. So if I select this range here, we can see just these little bits of cloud up here are being selected. So we can use our color correct uh, to change uh, the clouds. We can make them a little bit more blue and we can see uh, that we get a blue tint here. We're also picking up some blue on the highlights of our balloons. So often what you're going to need to do is mask off different parts of your image using different techniques, shapes, 
for example, combined with Luma keys, so that you just get the bit that you want. And let's demonstrate how we can combine two masks together. So let's use a shape node to create a secondary mask for this image. It's not in fact the most efficient way to do it. The most efficient way to do it is using the rotor shape node. Uh, but that's rather complicated and I'm going to do a separate uh, video series on the use of rotor shape. So let's just lay down a shape node. And I'm going to feed uh, the image that we've imported into the input of the shape node. And I'm doing that partly because I want the shape node to produce an image which is of the same dimensions. In other words, 1024 by 795. And we can see that that's happening. And I'm going to change it to a rectangle. And I'm then going to display it. And we can see that although we don't see the shape, we can see the outline here, the bounding box of the shape. Uh, so I can resize and move the shape so that it more or less covers this patch of sky up here, which is what I want to focus on. And if we have a look at our alpha channel, uh, rather if we have a look at our M channel, which is the channel which is now going to contain the results of this shape node, because it's going to add a plane called M. And I appear to be looking at the M channel here, but I'm not getting what I expect. The reason for that is that I've got alpha selected, so I'm in fact looking at the alpha channel. Let me revert like this, and we can see that we just have this top part of the image here. So what I want to do is combine the luma key and this, so that I have a mask which just affects the top part of this image. And I can do that using a mask node. And this is one of the ways uh, to do it. There are other ways. So let's feed uh, my shape node into here and my luma key into the mask input. And I'm in fact not going to affect any of these planes. The only plane I'm going to affect is the M plane. So let's visualize this and let's have a look at the M plane. And what we can now see is that we've got a mask which covers that patch of sky with some bits missing where the luma key uh, mask was. So in fact, I want to invert this mask and then I can get just those parts of the cloud which were being selected by the luma key. And then I can feed the result of this in as a mask to my color correct. And let's visualize that. Well, nothing seems to be happening. The reason nothing's happening is by default we're using the alpha channel out of this as the mask and what we want to use instead is the M channel and that should mean, I've inverted the mask, that should mean that the effect of this color correct is just happening to those few bits of cloud up there in the corner. So that's one way of combining two different masks. Well I've cleared away uh, all of the other nodes that we had in order to look at uh, the color curves node. And the color curves node is probably the most powerful color correction node in Houdini. Uh, so it allows you to edit either globally or on a component by component basis the values of color in your scene. And let's have a look now at the global color curve and let me just click this button here which means we're dealing with all of the same color components all of the color components at once and this curve here shows that uh, where we have uh, a color component that has a value of 0.2 it's being mapped onto 0.2 it's having no effect let me add a point by left clicking somewhere on the line like so. And I can then move this point by clicking and dragging it. Now what's happening is a value of 0.2 is being increased to 0.55. And we can see the effect of that. Uh, we've got a much brighter scene. We can edit this on a component by component basis as I mentioned. So let's edit the red component and that's bringing that back down to a more or less flat curve. 
and let's edit the green component and let's bring that down to a more or less flat curve. So now we've just got the blue component as a component which is affecting our scene and we can see that that's making the scene much much bluer. So each of these components what's happening is Houdini is looking at the pixel it's saying that pixel for example has a blue value of 0.2 it's replacing that value of 0.2 with 0.55 and it's replacing the value of 0.6 with 0.85 and so on. So this is a very very powerful way to affect the coloration of your image. Notice that you the components of your curves are given here as points and this leads me on to another remark about Compositor, which is that just as in a standard SOP context or modeling context, all of these can be animated. So let's try doing that. Let me take the red curve and I'm going to Alt left click like so. I'm then going to move to frame 5. Now our image isn't going to change because we don't have a frame dependent image. But I can now go into my Edit Color Curves and I can have a look at my red component and I can move this up so that it's really quite dramatic. And then I can Alt Left Click. Uh, and in fact I had Auto Keying set so it's already keyed those values. So what should happen now is that each, each frame the color correction of this image is going to change and we can see indeed it gets redder and redder as we scrub along the timeline. Let me now move on from looking at color correction and I should remark that there are a great many other very powerful color correction nodes here in the compositor and you'll want to experiment with those. So we're going to move on from color correction and have a look at compositing. Uh, that is compositing one image over another. So let me use a file node to bring in uh, some of the images that we made earlier. So let's bring in everything. Now I'm going to control C, control V and I'm going to bring in the TARDIS and I'm going to bring in the Daleks. And let's have a look at some simple compositing. And there are a series of compositing nodes in Houdini. Uh, they're here under the comps section of the tab menu. And in addition to these, uh, there's a sort of all-encompassing compositing node here which can achieve most of the effects achieved using these other nodes. So let's just lay one of those down and we can have a look at how it works. So all of the compositing nodes tend to have two inputs as well as a mask input here. And one of the inputs is the background and the other is the foreground. So let's feed our Daleks into the background and our TARDIS into the foreground. And let's visualize that. And by default, uh, the operation is over, which means that we overlay this image over the top of this image. But we take into account the alpha of this image. And of course, if we have a look at that, we can see that that only has a value where the TARDIS is and not elsewhere. And we overlay it over this image. And we see we don't quite get what we want because the TARDIS is just stuck over the top of these images. Uh, the Daleks are hidden behind it here, which shouldn't be, uh, and so it's not what we want. Let's have a look at some of the other operations. Under is just the reverse of over. It swaps, in effect, these two inputs. So now we're compositing the Dalek background over the image of the TARDIS. Up top, uh, we can see, just combines the images where they both have an overlapping alpha. 
inside and outside, do similar things uh, by changing the way the alpha affects the image. Screen, which is very similar to over, but allows you to see through, makes the, the, the foreground image transparent, and so on. Let me just quickly have a word about add. Uh, this just adds the color components of the two images. And this is sometimes useful, as we'll see in later videos, when, for example, we're adding reflections to an image. But you have to be terribly careful when using add that you don't add together your alpha channels. Let's have a look at our alpha channel of this result. And if we inspect it, we can see we've got an alpha of 2 in some places. Alpha should always between, be between 0 and 1, and you can get into trouble if you allow your alpha to go above 1. So turn off uh, its effect, like so. Uh, that will then produce a problem, because our TARDIS is no longer featuring, the alpha of our TARDIS is no longer featuring. Uh, so an alternative is to include it, but then use something called a limit node, which allows you to limit the value of uh, your plane. And in this case, I'm just going to affect the alpha uh, to a value between 0 and 1. We can see that's corrected the problem. I'm not going to go through all the various options for the compositing node. Uh, the Houdini documentation explains quite carefully what all of these do. But I am going to have a look at how we can avoid this problem that the TARDIS is being composited directly over the Daleks in a way that we don't want. And the way we do that is by using the images that were created using the matte shading option. So let's bring those in. And uh, they were called image one, I think. And image TARDIS. Let's refresh our memory as to what they look like. The image one has the TARDIS visible the Daleks are matted out, and the image TARDIS has the TARDIS matted out, matted out with Daleks. Both uh, contain the ground plane. That's probably a mistake. We should have excluded that from one of the two of them. So let's lay down a composite node, and I want to composite uh, the Daleks over the TARDIS. We can see that's worked as we would have expected. Uh, this Dalek in the foreground is obscuring the TARDIS, which is in turn obscuring this Dalek in the background here. And by separating out these images like this, we can apply color correction and other effects to one element of our scene and not to another. So let's lay down a color correct node. And I'm going to darken the color of our TARDIS. So let's Darken it down like that. And we can see that we can affect the color of the TARDIS without affecting the color of the Daleks. Although, unfortunately, because we included uh, the ground plane in both images, we are affecting the color of the ground plane. Well, that's an introduction to how to use the compositor in Houdini. And I'm going to finish off by showing you how to write out an image from the compositor to a file. But before we do that, I'm going to add a node here which will allow us to change the color depth of our image. So at the moment, uh, we've got an image which is 16-bit floating point. And I probably want, for the purposes of outputting it, to change this to 8-bit. So this by default is set to that, in fact, 8-bit integer. So this will ensure that coming out of this node, my color and alpha planes are 8-bit integer. And then in order to output uh, this image, I need to have a rock file output node. 
And this allows me to set a frame range. I'm going to leave that just at a single frame. It allows me to choose where that picture is going to go. And I shall put dollar hip output dot png in this case. And it's going to give me some options for information to embed into the image. It's going to ask me which planes I want to output. So by default, it outputs the color plane and the alpha plane. It allows me to set a gamma for the output. And that's essentially it. This option here will ensure that all the files are reloaded in before uh, the compositing network is evaluated. Now, by default, uh, I should mention this, these file inputs cache uh, the value of their input. So if you were to re-render your scene and recreate this image, it wouldn't affect your composite network. Uh, the old version would still be being stored. In order to get rid of the old version, you need to reload sequence. You need to hit this button, and then the images will be reloaded for that particular file node. So let's enable that option here to make sure our, all our images are being reloaded. And we've set it up. Uh, this tab, by the way, allows you to crop the area that you render out. This tab allows you to create a number of additional files at the same time from other planes in your uh, compositing network. And you can run some scripts before and after your render. So let's just select that, hit render. And that's rendered out already. And we can load up MPay in order to find that. And we should see that there's something called output. And that gives us our image. So that brings us to the end of this introduction to the compositor in Houdini.